Well, good morning, Redwood family. Many years ago, fourth grade Tyler was uh, at my friend's house named Joel. And we were having a Nerf war or a water war. I don't really remember the details. All I remember is I was wearing sandals. And I love these sandals. I mean, they slightly hindered mobility, uh, but not by much. Uh, as another side note, uh, many years, uh, a couple years later at school, I forgot my shoes to do the mile test. And I ended up running the sub six minute mile on these things. So these sandals, I could, I could move in them decently. So anyway, back to fourth grade. So I round the corner to get a tactical advantage on my friend with the water pistol or whatever, and, and I don't see the wooden barrier that keeps the playground gravel where it's supposed to be. And I slam into it, my foot slams into the wooden barrier with most of the energy going into my baby toe. <sighs> yeah, very painful. I quickly declared defeat to my friend, which is how you know something is seriously wrong with me, right? Because I am very competitive. Uh, I do everything I could do to not cry, to hobble home, uh, but of course I don't tell my parents, right? Uh, the next day, the pain and swelling was so great in my toe, I couldn't even get a sock over it. So I go to school in the same sandals and of course show off to all my friends, my war wound, you know. But a, a couple days later, uh, the aide at school, one of the, the teacher's aides, notices that pernicious red line running up my ankle, eh? Some of you guys know what, what, what's going on there. Maybe a staph infection or something. We'd have to ask Steve. You know, he could help us out. Uh, but um, so not good. And she says that I need to go tell my mom. Okay, no problem. I tell my mom. She's like, you well, you have to go to the doctor. Oh, big problem. <laughs> and so we go to the doctor. And uh, I'll spare you the gory details. But my doctor gently squeezes my toe, but firmly to remove the, you know, infectious material. And so I'm shrieking, I'm crying, I am angry, uh, I'm sweating. Who knew such a small body part could hurt so bad? And through the process, I tearfully blame my doctor, my mom, my teacher's aide, my, my friend, whoever put in the playground equipment, you know. Um, but I soon got some perspective, right? Because left untreated, this thing, I could have lost my foot. I could have lost my leg, and of course, in very rare cases, that little infectious red line can go all the way to your heart and kill you. So, you know, and I think we've experienced this before in our lives in this area, the, the idea of the pain of progress. Before my toe healed, it needed to hurt more under the guidance of the loving doctor. Right? And so today we're going to see this in Exodus chapters 4 and 5. And we're going to see this, and this is our big idea today. When things get worse, God is at work. When things get worse, God is at work. So everyone say it with me. When things get worse, God is at work. And so that is what I hope we leave today. If you remember nothing else, I hope that cheesy phrase is stuck in your head, uh, but it's true. And so we see for Moses and Israel, things are getting much worse. First, worse at home. Exodus 4.19 says this, the Lord had said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt for all those who wanted to kill you are dead. Great. So God took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. Verse 24, at a lodging place along the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But Zipporah took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. At that time, she said, bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. What a strange story. Uh, you might have noticed Austin conveniently skipped that last week in chapter 4. No, I told him he could, but he was very relieved uh, to transfer this story to me. Um, what might be happening here, we're not really sure. There's a lot we don't know. Um, but what's probably happening is Moses had not obeyed God's command of circumcision. We read in Genesis 17, this was a sign for the, the Israelites. This was important to God. God took this negligence very seriously and was about to respond to it, but the lady, Zipporah, saves the day. Which, side note, these kinds of stories are really interesting to me. If Israel fabricated the book of Exodus, they would not have included this story that makes Moses look like a dunderhead and, you know, the, the, the ladies saving the day in a culture and a time period that didn't value women like we do today, um, this is an incredibly progressive document. So, interesting side note, progressive in the best sense of that word. But what is clear is that all is not well at home. 
things are getting worse. A little bit of conjecture, but Moses is probably not happy about almost getting killed. Zipporah, the wife, is not happy about Moses' passivity. And I guarantee the young boy isn't real happy about the rapid surgical procedure. <laughs> Hold still, son, you know. Yikes, not good. There are tears, turbulence, and <laughs> tension in this family. Things are getting worse at home. Well, things are also getting worse at work. For Moses, and especially the Israelites, work is probably a nice way to put it. Remember, they're enslaved in Egypt. And we'll pick up the majority of our text in chapter 5, Exodus 5, verse 1. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go, so they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. And I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews had met, has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, Look, the, the people of the land are now numerous, and you're stopping them from working. That same day, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That's why they're crying out. Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the people so that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. Then the slave drivers and overseers went out and said to the people, This is what Pharaoh says. I will not give you any more straw. Go get your own straw wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced at all. So the people scattered all over Egypt to gather stubble to use for straw. The slave drivers kept pressuring them, saying, Complete the work required of you for each day, just as when you had straw. And Pharaoh's slave drivers beat the Israelites' overseers they had appointed, demanding, Why haven't you met your quota of bricks yesterday or today as before? And the Israelite overseers went and appealed to Pharaoh, Why have you treated your servants this way? Your servants are given no straw, yet we're told, Make bricks. Your servants are being beaten, but the fault is with your own people. Pharaoh said, Lazy. That's what you are. Lazy. That's why you keep saying, Let us go sacrifice to the Lord. Now get to work. You will not be given any straw. Yet you must produce your full quota of bricks. The Israelite overseers realized they were in trouble when they were told you were not to reduce the number of bricks required for you each day. This is God's word. So Moses and Aaron confront Pharaoh, ready to be these liberating leaders, these heroes in the mind of everybody, ready for a quick deliverance. And Pharaoh just says, no, you're not going anywhere. And to drive his point home to prove his power, he orders that they stop the assembly line. No more raw materials to the Israelites to make bricks. You guys need to find your own material. You need to find your own straw for the bricks, essentially doubling the job description, but requiring the same output. So he, he requires the same quota, and this power play doesn't benefit him at all. It doesn't benefit the empire. Productivity goes down, but this is a vindictive power move to break them down that's reminiscent of nazi work camps where they would have people dig holes or ditches just to fill them in again totally pointless to to break down no accomplishment evil the israelites cannot accomplish this task that's the point the game is rigged and so it becomes an excuse for the egyptians to abuse and beat them and you know who gets blamed for all this right Partially Pharaoh, but mostly Moses. Moses gets uh, the, the blame here. So things get worse at home, worse at work, and then worse with allies, worse with peers and, and his own people. Right Back in Exodus 4.31, the people believed, and when they heard the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. But not a full chapter later, their excitement has worn off, and they've turned against Moses and Aaron. Exodus 5.20. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, may the Lord look on you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials have put a sword in their hand to kill us. So Moses has done what God has told him to do. And his peers are turning on him. 
Things are getting worse. And before we get on our high horse towards the Israelites, we don't know what it would be like to be a slave, right? To, to have your humanity reduced, to be beaten, to be treated, treated like an animal or like property. No hope for freedom. In fact, freedom is, is dangerous. Freedom uh, is not something to pursue, right? Life becomes about managing risk, not stirring anything up, managing pain, making the masters happy. And so when Moses comes in and stirs up the hornet's nest and people start getting stung, it's a problem, right? We, we got to settle things down. Moses, chill out, man. We, we got to get things back to normal. And Moses sees this. He sees the pain and the problems he's causing. He sees that things are getting worse. And so finally, he complains. There's a lot of blaming going on. It's almost like Genesis chapter 3. But he, he then blames who? God. Things are seemingly getting worse with God. Exodus 5.22. Moses returned to the Lord and said, Why, Lord, have you brought trouble on this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. So Moses points the finger squarely at God. This is all your fault. Wow. God doesn't get defensive. He doesn't get angry at Moses for his complaint. In fact, I really believe God welcomes our frustrations and fears and doubts. I know this because there's a book called The Psalms, right? People are constantly yelling at God in the book. Because even when things feel bad with God, with uh, friends and work and family, and we yell to him about it, we yell at him about it, it actually shows we believe he's there and that he cares and that he can do something about it, and that he's listening. God simply responds by repeating his promise. Right? When things get worse, God is at work. Exodus 6, 6, God reiterates his promise. I am the Lord, Moses. I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Ever since chapter 3, God's saying this stuff over and over and over again. It gets a little repetitive, but we need it, right? We need it uh, pounded into our heads. And so God assures Moses, things are right on schedule. I'm still at work. Nothing's changed. I will still bring Israel out of Egypt. You'll see the fireworks soon enough, Moses, but just sit back and trust me in this process. There's probably no greater illustration than this, uh, with this concept than, than one word, the dentist. Right? I've never met anyone who enjoys going to the dentist. Uh, it's like on the list of things I want to do today, getting poked and prodded with sharp objects and listening to elevator music, in my mouth is not, you know, high on the list. Um, you know, especially if I have a cavity, a root canal, or, uh, you know, wisdom teeth removal. But every time I'm at the dentist, I remind myself, what would this have been like 50 years ago, 100 years ago? Not good. The short-term discomfort turns into long-term rewards, even though it's largely unappreciated. So you might be saying, okay, Tyler, teeth management, that's one thing. But why does God's work around us take so much time? Why doesn't he just snap his fingers and fix things? He could do that, right? Why do things often have to get worse before they get better? Ancient theologian John Calvin noted six reasons why God didn't instantly you know, free the Israelites and fry Pharaoh. And so I kind of summarize them in my own words. Uh, six reasons that God didn't do this instantly. Uh, one, he wanted to more clearly display his power in the face of constant opposition. Two, God wanted a more memorable moment of his love towards others. Three, God wanted to teach his people patience and endurance so that we wouldn't give up when we don't get instant results. Four, God wanted to show that his hand will always prevail no matter the opposition. Five, Calvin says that God wanted to show that the illusionists and the magicians were frauds and to keep us uh, reminded that there are false teachings. And six, Calvin says that God wanted to demonstrate both the responsibility that Pharaoh and unbelievers have and also the darkness that possesses them. 
So I thought that was really uh, insightful as, as Calvin kind of reflected on the same story that we are. And to sum him up in my own words, sometimes things are sweeter and better when they take more time. The works of God are more memorable, more defining, more holistic, more inspiring of gratitude, and they make a far better story. Right? Good memories rarely make good movies. Right? It sometimes is the difficult things that we overcome that make the best stories later. And so in the short time remaining together, I want us to talk about some real practical examples about when things get worse, God is at work. So some examples of this. First, the most fundamental example of this is simply becoming a Christian. How so? Well, for someone to become a Christian, he or she has to admit that she needs a savior. For someone to become a Christian, he needs to admit that he's not king. He's not the authority of his life anymore. And that's sometimes a really hard realization. Ephesians 2.8, for it's by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. So becoming a Christian is when we shed our self-righteousness and pride, we humble ourselves, and we realize we have nothing to brag about. It's humbling. The religious word is repentance. A painful turning away from our old life and turning to Jesus. And scripture even uses that metaphor of death, of dying to self. Something in me has to die before something new can uh, be replaced. Something has to get worse in me before the, the new replaces it. Romans 10, 9, my favorite gospel verse, right? But if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Maybe you've never done that before. Maybe you've never humbled yourself and said, Jesus, you are Lord. And I believe in your heart that God raised you from the dead. Salvation, it's a free gift, but it can only be received with empty hands. We have to descend before we ascend. How about relational conflict? Uh, in line with disappointment, one huge area of God's work in us and through us is through relational conflict. For marriage counseling, Karina and I have been going through this book called uh, What Did You Expect by Paul David Tripp. And in chapter three, the author brings up, I presume, a fictional couple named Gwen and Barry, uh, but I'm sure their experience is very universal. And Gwen and Barry are at the end of the rope in their marriage. Uh, he says their sweetness, the sweetness has evaporated from their marriage. Their friendship has faded away. The person they dated doesn't seem to be the person they're now living with. No amens, okay? There is distance, coldness, impatience, and conflict that wasn't there in the beginning, he says. So for them, marriage was supposed to be the goal, the dream, the life Gwen and Barry always wanted. But things get worse and worse. And as I'm reading this, I'm kind of going with the disciples Man, if this is true, what's the point of marriage? Why even get married, you know? But, um, you know, as I continued reading, right, when things get worse, God is at work. So what's going on here? And he says this, and I think I put it on the screen for you. This quote just really rocked me this week. For Gwen and Barry, this sad and disillusioning moment is not the end of it all, but the beginning of something wonderful. We could argue that God now has them right where he wants them. They are no longer attracted to one another out of self-centered de desire. This is not a defeat. This is an opportunity to exit the kingdom of self and enjoy the kingdom of God. Amen. See, God's not abandoning their marriage. God is right in the midst of it. Last sentence here. Gwen and Mary's marriage did not die, says Paul Tripp. The selfish dream did. And when it did, real, sturdy, satisfying, other-centered, God-honoring, perseverant love began to grow. You see, what if we saw conflicts in our relationships, all of them, this is not for just married people, as not obstacles, but opportunities to grow closer to one another and to be more like Christ and to help others in the relational riptide that we all experience. There's something about conflict that's going to make me a way better person or a way worse person. But I'm not going to stay the same. I'm not going to stay the same. 
How about divorce? Sadly, some of you are experiencing or have experienced divorce. And I'm so sorry that's happening in your life right now. How does Exodus 5 speak to you in this? We know that God hates divorce, but he loves you. And and when things get worse, God's at work. He's at work in you. He's speaking peace to your heart. He's at work through you as you're able to walk others through this difficult season. How about wayward children? Many of you have... uh, are concerned about your struggling wayward children. Your kids aren't walking with God or they've taken some hits in life or they're they're struggling and you know you can't fix it. What might God be up to? Well, I don't have all the answers and sometimes we have to be careful trying to know all the answers, but he might be developing in you a greater dependency, a greater trust, teaching you how to pray more and more. Hell knows no adversity like a praying mom or grandma, amen? Amen. Right? And sadly, sometimes people in our lives need to hit rock bottom before they can start looking up. Things may need to get worse before they get better in their lives. What about health or a financial crisis? On the surface, sometimes it's a wake-up call to change habits, to eat healthier, to exercise, stick to a budget, get more sleep, but more deeply... These health scares and financial fears can be a huge check engine light in our lives. Most of us ignore that thing. It's not, often a, it's not until the car smells funny or breaks down altogether that we actually go get it checked out. That we go fix the real problem. See, our health and wealth and lack thereof often points to deeper life-depleting problems. And as the doctor squeezed the junk out of my toe, these problems can be of similar value to our lives. Last example here. What about vulnerable confession? Is he being vulnerable with someone? Sharing my fears, my sins, my shame? That's a great example of things getting worse, but God still being at work. You see, in the short run, when I share these things, something embarrassing to a trusted friend, It's not comfortable or easy, is it? In fact, you know, my stock goes down. My reputation's tainted. My secret's out. But what usually happens? When I share, you know, when I share these things, suddenly they lose a bit of the grip that they once had on me. Right? Now it's not just in my head. It's out there. It kind of loses its power. Someone once said this and Specifically in regards to shame, the more we share, the less we have. And I think that's true. The more shame we share with others, the less we'll have. The more fear, the more insecurity we share with others, the less we'll have. And the, ver- the reverse, I think, is true as well. The less anxiety I share with others, the more I'll have. The less sin I share with others, the more I'll have. The less temptation I share, the more I'll have. You see, the discomfort, the embarrassment, the risk of sharing something with someone pales in comparison to the work that God will do through us and in us when we do so. And I know those of you who are, are, who are in my life group, I've been so impressed by your willingness to share and, and be open in our group. And those of you who are in life groups, I just encourage you in that as you grow and trust with your, your group. Well, what's amazing about God's work through the worst is that he doesn't just do it from a distance, right? Like a computer hacker, you know, or a drone pilot. No, he actually enters into our world, literally, in the person of Jesus. Things get more and more difficult for him. He lives a hard life and then dies the worst death on the cross because he takes the worst of the world, your worst, my worst, onto himself. And through the worst thing the universe has ever seen, the killing of God at the hands of humans, God does the greatest work the universe has ever seen. Conquering sin and death for us. Giving us a new future and a new present perspective. And so it's because of Jesus' work for us that Paul can say this in 2 Corinthians 4.8, we are hard pressed on every side but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, 
but not destroyed. And then verse 17, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Light and momentary troubles. Isn't that an interesting way for Paul to talk about his problems? If you read about him, they look anything but light and momentary. They look more like crushing and permanent. But Paul recognizes what Jesus has done for him and the future that he's purchased for him. You see, sometimes things in life don't ever get better. Sometimes, like Paul, you lose your head. Or things go worse and worse. But Paul has an eternal perspective. These things in life matter, but they're light and momentary. I love what Tim Keller says. He puts it like this. Every horrible thing that has ever happened for the Christian will not only be undone and repaired, but in some way make the eventual glory and joy even greater. How many of you have ever had a dream in the middle of the night where something horrible happened? And as a young boy, I had a dream that my sisters and myself got burned and killed by the bad guy in Fox and the Hound. And, and, and I woke up sweating and crying. But what happens when you wake up? There's an instant sense of relief that washes over you. You appreciate your life. I appreciated my sisters for 30 seconds, you know. <laughs> and was, oh, you know, hugging them. Oh, I love you, you know. And, and you appreciate your family members more. You're so relieved. And I think that's an imperfect example of what's coming for us as, the, as, as Christians. We, we have that hope that one day we're going to, in a sense, wake up. And all the bad we've experienced will somehow be totally redeemed. At the end of Lord of the Rings, the third one, Samwise Gamgee discovers that his friend Gandalf was not dead, as he once thought. And, and he realizes he's alive. Gandalf's alive. And he exclaims, I thought, Gandalf, you were dead. But then I thought I was dead myself. Is everything sad going to come untrue? And the answer that Christianity gives to Sam's question is yes. Yes. Everything sad is going to come untrue and will somehow be greater for having once been broken and lost. So not only is God working in the present, but he's got new creation, restoration plans for the future. And so everything we experience now will only add to the intensity of the joy then. So River Valley Redwood, don't waste your worst because God is at work. Let's pray.